1851, under the auspices of Prince Albert, husband of Queen Victoria, and organized by the inventor and civil servant Henry Coyle, the City of London and the nation of England hosted what was known as the Great Exhibition of the Works of Industry of All Nations in Hyde Park. Widely regarded as the first of the World Fairs or Exhibitions, the Great Exhibition, as it was generally known, ran from May 1st to August 15th of the year and housed some 13,000 displays from 44 nations and their various colonies. Housed in a spectacularly engineered structure, constructed entirely out of standardized pieces of glass and wrought iron known as the Crystal Palace, the six-month-long extravaganza hosted over five million visitors and was a huge artistic, industrial, and commercial success. At the end of the exhibition, some of the proceeds of the gate receipts were used to fund a lecture series designed to look back on the exhibition's importance and impact and was attended by scholars and students of the great British universities. While he had not been involved in the organization, planning, or execution of the event, William Ewell, by this time Master of Trinity College, had attended the exhibition on several occasions, impressed by the structure, the displays, and most of all, the general spirit of cooperation and progress evidenced throughout the culture of the event. Given his stature among the scientific and religious communities of Britain, Ewell was asked to give the inaugural lecture of the series, reflecting on the Great Exhibition. In the spirit of the past several years of offering a podcast as our Christmas gift to you, the crew, we present this lecture in its entirety. A word of caution. We've not changed any of the language of the lecture, and so it will likely come across as a bit anachronistic in style and, in a few instances, vocabulary, at least to the modern ear. Moreover, there are, few, there are a few additional notes to be shared. First, Wewell's worldview is, in many ways, profoundly Victorian, with the attendant attitudes of colonialism and paternalism towards colonial peoples. What I hope you'll notice, however, is that he does clearly break with the worst versions of that paradigm. Second, there are a couple of words you may not be familiar with, including caoutchouc, which was the term of the time for natural rubber, and gutta percha, which was a similar sort or is a similar sort of tree sap. These were relatively recent discoveries, at least to the Europeans, and would prove to be of immense importance over time. Finally, while some of the material is specifically designed for the audience familiar with the experience of having attended the exhibition, and as such, of limited accessibility to those of us who have not had a chance to attend such an event, Ewell makes a number of general points that are relevant today, over 150 years after the lecture was written, given, and then published in the Edinburgh New Philosophical Journal. And so, in the Norwegian tradition of Jollibokaflod, we hope you'll enjoy this presentation of one of the works of William Ewell. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Season 4, Science and Certainty. Episode 6.1, Supplemental. William Ewell, On the General Bearing of the Great Exhibition. Inaugural Lecture The Great Bearing of the General Exhibition on the Progress of Art and Science by William Ewell, Doctor of Divinity, Fellow Royal Society master of Trinity College. It seems to me as if I were one of the persons who have had the least right of any to address an audience like this on the subject of the great exhibition of the art and industry of all nations. 
of which the doors have so lately closed. Inasmuch as I had no connection with that great event, nor relation to it, except that of a mere spectator, one of the many millions there. The eminent and zealous men, in whose wide views it originated, by whose indomitable energy and perseverance the great thought of such a spectacle was embodied in a visible material shape, those who, from our own countries or from foreign lands, supplied it with the treasures and wonders of art, those who, with scrutinizing eye and judicial mind, compared those treasures and those wonders and stamped their approval on the worthiest, those who can point to the glories of the exhibition and say, Quorum pars magna fui, or, in which I played a great part. Those persons may well be considered as having a right to express to you the thoughts which have been suggested by the scenes in which they have thus had to live. But of these I am not one. I have been in the exhibition, as I have said, a mere spectator. Nevertheless, the Council of the Society of Arts have done me the honor to express a wish that I should offer to you such reflections as the spectacle of the great exhibition has suggested to me, and in deference to their wishes, and especially as a token of my admiration of the tru truly royal mind which saw clearly, in despite of the maxims of antiquity, that there was such a royal road to knowledge. I shall venture to offer you a few remarks, which, precisely on account of the circumstances which I have stated, may be considered as representing the views of an unconnected, unconnected spectator of the great spectacle. To write or speak the epilogue after any great and grand drama is by no means an easy task. We see the confession of the difficulty in the very incongruity of the manner in which the task is sometimes attempted as, when after the curtain has fallen upon a deep and solemn tragedy, some, some startling attempt at wit and pleasantry is uttered to the audience. It may be by one of the characters whose deep sorrows or lofty aims we have been following with the profoundest interest. You well you will at least, on the present occasion, not have the difficulty of the task shown in this manner. Nor indeed is it my office, in any sense, to speak an epilogue at all. Perhaps such remarks as I have to make may rather be likened to the criticism which comes after the drama. For, as you know, criticism does come after poetry. The age of criticism after the age of poetry. Aristotle after Sophocles, Longinus after Homer. And the reason of this has been well pointed out in our time, that words, that human language, appear in the form in which the poet utters them and, the, or, and works with them for his purposes, before they appear in the form in which the critic must use them. Language is picturesque and affecting first. It is philosophical and critical afterwards. It is first concrete and then abstract. It acts first, it analyzes afterwards. And this is the case not only with words, but with works also. The poet, as the Greeks call him, was the maker, as our English fathers also were wont to call him. And man's power of making may show itself not only in the beautiful texture of language, the grand machinery of the epic, the sublime display of poetical imagery, but in those material works which supply originals from which are taken the derivative terms which I have just been compelled to use, in the textures of soft wool or fine linen or glossy silk, where the fancy deports itself in wreaths of visible flowers, in the machinery mighty as the thunderbolt to rend the oak, or light as the breath of air which carries the flower dust to its appointed place, in the images which express to the eye beauty and dignity, as the poet's verse does to the mind, so that it is difficult to say whether Homer or Phidias is more truly a poet. That mighty building, then, along the aisles of which we have wandered day after day in the past months, full as it was of the works of man, contained also the works of many who were truly makers who stamped upon matter and the combinations of matter 
that significance and efficacy which makes, which makes it a true exponent of the inward activity of man. The objects there, the symbols, instruments, and manifestations of beauty and power were utterances, articulate utterances of the human mind, no less than if they had been audible words and melodious sentences. There were expressed in the ranks of that great display many beautiful and many powered thoughts of gifted men of our own and other lands. The Crystal Palace was the cabinet in which were contained a vast multitude of compositions, not of words but of things, in which we who wandered along its corridors and, gal and galleys might c contemplate day by day so as to possess ourselves in some measure and according to our ability of their meanings, power, and spirit. And now, that season of the perusal of such a collection of works being passed, those days of wonderment at the creations of such a poetry being gone by, the office of reading and enjoying being over, the time of criticism seems to have arise. We must now consider what it is that we have admired, and why must try to analyze the works which we have thus gazed upon and to discover the principles of their excellence. As the critic of literary art endeavors to discern the laws of man's nature by which he can produce that which is beautiful and powerful, operating through the medium of language, so the critic of such art as we have had here presented to us, of material art as we may term it, endeavors to discern the laws of material nature to learn how man can act by there, operating through the medium of matter, and thus produce beauty and utility and power. This kind of criticism appears to be the natural and proper sequel, sequel to such a great burst of production and exhibition as, have we have, as we have had to witness, to discover what the laws of operative power are after having had so much, so great a manifestation of what they do. To discover the laws of operative power in literary work, though it claims no small respect under the name of criticism, is not commonly considered the work of a science. But to discover the laws of operative power in material productions, whether formed by man or brought into being by nature herself, is the work of a science, and is, deed, is indeed what we more especially term science. And thus, in the case with which we have to do, we have instead of the criticism which naturally comes after the general circulation of poetry, the science which naturally comes after a great exhibition of art. Two cases of succession connected by a very close and profound analogy. That this view of the natural and general succession of science to art as of criticism to poetry is not merely fanciful and, fanciful and analogical we may easily convince ourselves by looking for an instant at the progress of art and science in past times. For we see that, in general, art has preceded science. Men have executed great and curious and beautiful works before they had a scientific insight into the principles on which the success of their labors was founded. There are good artificers in brass and iron before the principles of chemistries of metal are known. There was wine among men before there was a philosophy of vinous fermentation. There were mighty masses raised into the air, cyclopean walls and drumlecks, obelisks and pyramids, probably giant Doric pillars and entablatures, before there was a theory of the mechanical power. The earlier generations did, the later explained what it had been possible to do. Art was the mother of science the vigorous and comely mother of a daughter of far loftier and serener beauty. And, as it had been in the period of scientific activity in the ancient world, so it was again in the modern period in which science began her later growth. The Middle Ages produced or improved a vast body of arts, parchment and paper, printing and engraving, glass and steel, compass and gunpowder, docks and watches, microscopes and telescopes, not to speak of the marvels of architecture, sculpture, and painting. All had their origin and progress while the sciences of the recent times were in their cradle or were unborn. 
the dawn of the sixteenth century presented, as it were, a great exhibition of the works which men had been producing from the time of the downfall of the Roman civilization and skill. There, too, might be seen by him who traveled from land to land beautiful textures, beautiful vessels of gold and bronze, of porcelain and glass, wonderful machines, mighty fabrics, and, from t that time, stimulated by the sight of such a mass of the works of human skill, stimulated still more by the natural working of those powers of man from which such skill had arisen, men were led to seek for science as well as art. For science is the natural complement of art, and fulfillment of the thoughts and hopes which art excites. For science as the fully developed blossom of which art is the wonderfully involved bud. Stimulated by such influences, the scientific tendencies of modern Europe took their starting impulse from the great exhibition of the productions of the Middle Ages which had accumulated in the 16th century and have ever since been working onwards with ever increasing vigor and in an ever expanding sphere. As the successful scientific speculation of the last three centuries have been the natural sequel to the art energies of the preceding ages, so must the newest scientific speculations of our contemporaries and their successors, in order to be successful, be the result and consequences of the powers, as yet often appearing in the undeveloped form of art alone, which exists among us in the present day. And thus, a great spectacle of the works of material art ought to carry with it its scientific moral. And the opportunities which we have lately had of surveying the whole world in which art reigns, and of appreciating the results of its sway, may well be deemed too valuable to be let slip for the purposes of that scientific speculation which is the proper sequence of such occasions. So it has seemed to those who have from the beginning taking a lofty and comprehensive and hopeful view of the great undertaking of which the first act is now completed, and especially to that mind which is always taking the most lofty and most comprehensive and hopeful view. And in order to carry into effect this suggestion, it has been determined that persons well qualified to draw from the spectacle the series of scientific morals which it offers should present them to you here that critics should analyze for you some of the fine compositions with which you have become acquainted. The men of science should explain to you what you ought to learn from such an exhibition of art. And it has been thought that it might not be useless that you should be reminded, in the first place, how great and unique the occasion is, and how peculiar are some of the lessons which even the most general spectator, unfit to enter into the details of any of the special arts may draw from it. For indeed, it is obvious at a glance how great and unexampled is the opportunity thus given us, of taking a survey of the existing state of art in every part of the world. I have said that if in the 16th century an intelligent spectator could have traveled from land to land, he might in that way have seen a wonderful collection of works of man in many different countries, and combining all these in his thoughts, he would have had in his mind a representation of the whole progress of human art and industry up to the last moment, and a picture of that place which each nation at that moment occupied in the line of that progress. But what time, what labor, what perseverance, what hardships, what access to great and powerful men in every land, what happiness of opportunity, would be implied in the completion of such a survey. A life would scarcely suffice for it. A man could scarcely be found who would achieve it. With all the appliances and means with wealth and which wealth and power could give, he must, like the philosophers of ancient days, spend all of his years of vigor in traveling, must roam in the very varied regions of India, watch the artisan in the streets and towns of China, dive into the mines of Norway and of Mexico, live a life in the workshops of England, France, and Germany, and trace the western tide of industry and art as it spreads over the valley of the Mississippi. And when he had done this, and however carefully he had done it, yet how defective it must be, at least in one point. 
How far must it be from a contemporaneous view of the condition of the whole globe as to the material arts? During the time that he had been moving from place to place, the face of the world has been rapidly changing. When he saw Tunis, it was a barbarous state. Now that he has to make up his account, it is the first which asks for a leading place among the civilized communities of the industrialized world. When he visited the plains of Iowa and Wisconsin, they were wild prairies. Now they are the fields from which the cereal harvest is swept by the latest improved reaping machine. When he was at the Antipodes, the naked savage offered the only specimen of art in his rude club and frail canoe. Now there is a port whose lofty shifts, ships carry regularly to European markets multiplied forms of native produce and manufactures. Even if his picture be complete as to suffice, what anachronisms must there be in it? How much that it expresses not the general view of the earth, but the accidental peculiarities of the traveler's personal narrative? And then, how dim must be the images of the things seen many years ago compared to that which is present to the eye? How impossible to compare the one with the other, the object now seen in age with a similar object remembered in youth. And after all, when we have assumed such a traveler, such a one as has never been, the Ulysses of modern times, seeing the cities of many men and knowing their minds, seeing the workshops of all nations and knowing their arts, we have but one such. His knowledge is only his. He cannot, in any clear or effective manner, communicate a large, any large portion of it to others. It exists only for him. It perishes with him. And now, let us, in the license of epical imagination, suppose such a Ulysses, much seeing, much wandering, much enduring, to come to some island of Calypso, some well-inhabited city, under the rule of powerful and benign, but plainly, he must believe, superhuman influences, and there to find that image of the world and its arts, which he had vainly tried to build up in his mind, exhibited before his bodily eye in a vast crystal frame. True, in every minutest thread and hue, from the sparkle of the diamond to the mighty bulk of the Colossus, true to that which belongs to every part of the earth, and this with the effects which the arts produce, not at the intervals of the traveler's weary, weary journey, but everywhere at the present hour. And farther, let him see the whole population of the land, thousands upon thousands, millions upon millions, streaming to this site, gazing their fill day after day at this wonderful vision, inviting the men of neighboring and distant lands to gaze with them, looking at the objects, not like a fairy picture in the distant clouds, but close at hand, judging, comparing, scrutinizing the treasures produced by the all-bounteous earth and the indomitable efforts of man, from pole to pole, from east to west, or as he would learn more truly to measure, from east to east again. When we have supposed such a vision, we do not seem to have gone beyond quid quid grecia mendax audit in historia. All the wonders of that wondrous ancient Odyssean tale. And yet, in making such a supposition, have we not been exactly describing that which we have seen within these few months? Have we not ourselves made part of the population of such a charmed isle, of the crowds which have gazed upon such a magic spectacle? But now that we have had the spectacle before us, let us consider for a moment what the vision was and what were the reflections which it excited. We have offered to our review the choicest productions of human art in all nations, or at least collections which might be considered as representing all nations. Now, in nations compared with other nations, there is a difference. In a nation compared with itself as a, at an earlier time, there is progress. There may not always be a progress in good government. There may not necessarily be, though we would gladly hope that there is, a progress in virtue, in morality, in happiness. But there always is, except when very adverse influences roll back the common course of things, a progress in art and generally in science. 
In the useful or and ornamental arts, nations are always going forward, from stage to stage. Different nations have reached different stages of this progress, and all of their different stages are seen all at once, in the aspect which they have at this moment in the mag magical glass, which the enchanters of our time have made to rise out of the ground like an exhalation. The infancy of nations, their youth, their middle age, and their maturity all appear in their simultaneous aspect, like the most distant objects revealed at the same moment by a flash of lightning on a dusky night. Or we may compare the result to that which would be produced if we could suppose some one of skillful of one of the skillful photographers whose subtle apparatus we have had exhibited here could bring within his field of view the surface of the globe with all of its workshops and markets and produce instantaneously a permanent picture in which the whole were seen side by side. But it is not a mere picture of things which are found standing together that we have had presented to us. The great achievement was bringing them together you have, most of you probably heard, of the clear and economical critic who proposed to reduce the extravagance of the wish of the impatient separated lovers, that the gods would annihilate space and time, and who remarked that it would answer the end desired if one of the two were annihilated. By annihilating the space which separates different nations, we produce a spectacle in which is also annihilated the time which separates one stage of a nation's progress from another. An ingenious spectator or speculator of our own day, clothing these metaphysical abstractions in the form which modern science assigns them, has shown how we might, theoretically speaking, be, in a few instances, actual spectators bodily and contemporaneous, eyewitnesses of all the events which have passed since man has existed upon the earth. For, if we only imagine that, as the visual impressions on the vehicle of light by which alone vision can take place, travel away from the scenes by the occurrence of which their configuration was given to them, we also travel after this moving vision, and go but a very little faster than light itself we shall overtake successfully, successively the visual images of all the successive events and see them as truly as a truly distant spectator and what spectator is not more, dis, more or less distance but see them as a truly distant spectator sees what passes before his eyes. We might thus see now what is passing around us and in the next minute by rushing to the borders of the solar system where the images are still traveling outwards, see the first inhabitant of this island placing his foot on its coast, and in the intermediate distances we should successfully overtake and see, with our bodily eyes in inverted order, the events of the English, Norman, Saxon, Roman, and British times, and we might mark at each period the food, the clothing, the tools, the houses, the machines, and the implements of the various times. Now, that which the scientific dream thus presents us in imagination, the exhibition of industry and arts of all nations, has presented us as a visible reality. For we have had there collected examples of the food and clothing and other works of art of nations in every stage of progress from art. From old Hiti, so long in the eyes of Englishmen, the type of gentle and uncultured life. Queen Palmer sends mats and cloths, headdresses and female gear, which the native art of her women fabricates from their indigenous plants. Fulubaun, the last specimen of savage life with which this country has become connected, we have also clothes and armor, weapons and musical instruments. From all the wide domains which lie in and around our Indian Empire, we have rich and various contributions. From Singapore and Ceylon, Celebes and Java, Mengtal and Pam Pamalambang. The ruder and more primitive of these regions sent us their native food and clothing, their fishing nets and basket. But art soon goes beyond these first essays. 
from Sumatra, we have the loom and the plow, lacquered work and silken wares. And as we proceed from these, region, these outside regions to that of central and ancient India, so long the field of a peculiar form of civilization, we have endless and innumerable measures of skill and ingenuity, of magnificence and beauty. And yet we perceive that, in advancing from these to the productions of our own form of civilization, which has, even in that country, shown its greater power, we advance also to a more skillful, powerful, comprehensive, and progressive form of art. And looking at the whole of this spectacle of the arts, and life in all of their successive stages, there is one train of reflection which cannot fail, I think, to strike us. Namely this, in the first place, that man is, by nature and universally, an artificer, an artisan, an artist. We call the nations from which some specimens came as those which I first mentioned rude and savage, and yet how much is there of ingenuity, of invention, a practical knowledge of the properties of branch and leaf, of vegetable texture and fiber in the works of the rudest tribes? How much again the manual dexterity acquired by long and persevering practice, and even so not easy. And then again, not only how well adapted are these works of art to the mere needs of life, but how much of neatness, of prettiness, even of beauty, do they often possess, even when the work of savage hands. So that man is naturally, as I have said, not only an artificer, but an artist. Even we, while we look down from our lofty summit of civilized and mechanically aided skill upon the infancy of art, may often learn from them lessons of taste. So wonderfully and effectually has providence planted in man the impulse which urges him on to his destination, his destination which is to mold the bounty of nature into such forms as utility demands, and to show at every step that with mere utility he cannot be content. And when we come to the higher stages of cultured art, to the works of nations long civilized, through though inferior to ourselves, it may be in progressive civilization and mechanical power how much do we find in their works we must admire, which we might envy, which indeed might drive us to despair. Even still, the tissues and ornamental works of Persia and of India have beauties which we, with all of our appliances and means, cannot surpass. The gorgeous East showers its barbaric pearl and its gold on into its magnificent textures. But is there really anything barbaric in the skill and taste which they display? Does the Oriental prince or monarch, even if he can find his magnificence to native manufacturers, present himself to the eyes of his slaves in a less splendid or less elegant attire than the nobles and the sovereigns of this our western world, more highly civilized as we nevertheless deem it. Few persons, I think, would answer in the affirmative. The scarves and shawls, the embroidery and jewelry, the molding and carving which those countries can produce and which decorate their palaces and their dwelling their dwellers in palaces are even now such as we cannot excel. Oriental magnificence is still a proverbial mode of describing a degree of splendor and artisical, artisanical richness which is not found among ourselves. What then shall we say of ourselves? Wherein is our superiority? In what do we see the effect, the realization of that more advanced stage of art which we conceive ourselves to have attained? What advantage do we derive from the immense accumulated resources of skill and of mechanical ingenuity and mechanical power which we possess? Surely our imagined superiority is not all imaginary. Surely we really are more advanced than they, and that this term advanced has a meaning. Surely that mighty thought of progress in the life of nations is not an empty dream, and surely our progress has carried us beyond then. Where then is the import of the idea in this case? What is the leading and characteristic difference between them and us as to this matter? What is the broad and predominant distinction between the arts of nations rich, but in a condition of nearly stationary civilizations like oriental nations, and the nations which have felt the full influence of progress like ourselves. 
If I am not mistaken, the difference may be briefly expressed thus, that in those countries the arts are mainly ex ex exercised to gratify the tastes of the few, with us to supply the wants of the many. There, the wealth of a province is absorbed in the dress of a mighty warrior. Here, the gigantic weapons of the peaceful potentiate are used to provide clothing for the world. For that which makes it suitable, that machinery, constructed on a vast scale and embodying enormous capital, should be used in manufacture, is that the wares produced should be very great in quality, so that the smallest advantage in the power of working, being multiplied by a million fold, shall turn the scale of profit. And thus such machinery is applied when wares are manufactured for a vast population, when millions upon millions have to be clothed, or fed, or ornamented, or pleased, with such things so produced. I have heard one say, who had extensively and carefully studied the manufacturing establishments of this country, that when he began his survey he expected to find the most subtle and refined machinery applied to the most delicate and beautiful kind of work, to gold and silver, jewels and embroidery, but that when he came to examine he found that these works were mainly executed by hand, and that the most exquisite and expensive machinery was brought into play where operations on the most common materials were to be performed because these were to be executed on the widest scale. And this is when coarse and ordinary wares are manufactured for the many. This, therefore, is the meaning of the vast and astonishing prevalence of machine work in this country, that the machine with its million fingers works for millions of purchasers, while in remote countries where magnificence and savagery stand side by side. Tens of thousands work for one. There are labors for the rich alone. Here she works for the poor no less. There the multitude produce only to give splendor and grace to the despot or the warrior whose slaves they are, and whom they enrich. Here the man who is powerful in the weapons of peace, capital, and machinery uses them to give comfort and enjoyment to the public whose servant he is, and thus becomes rich while he enriches others with his goods. If this truly be the relation between the condition of the arts of life in this country and in those others, may we not, with reason and with gratitude, say that we have, indeed, reached a point beyond theirs in the social progress of nations? I have, perhaps, detained you too long with these general reflections, suggested by the mere general aspect of that great display of the works of nations in every stage of progress, which we have had lately before our eyes. But I hope you will recollect that I began by claiming the privilege of speaking as a mere spectator, who had not, or who had not had occasion to study the objects there assembled in a special and official manner. There is, however, one view of the subject, perhaps a little less obvious, which I should wish to endeavor to bring before you. I mean the view suggested by the classification of which such a collection has been found to be capable. Perhaps, at the first thought, it might be supposed to divide any collections of things, however numerous and various, into classes is a work of no great difficulty, though when the collection is great it may require much time. For it might be said, you only have to determine according to what resemblances and what differences you will make your classes, and then go through the work sticking to these. But anyone who has attended, attended a little more to the science of classification, or even who has made the attempt on any considerable scale, knows that this is not so, and that except the scheme of classes be very skillfully and happily devised, it lands us in intolerable incongruities and even in impossibilities. Indeed, without seeking any exemplification of this remark in the classificatory sciences, which can throw on this subject only a distant and doubtful light, we have experimental evidence of the difficulty of classifying a great collection of objects of art and industry in the attempts which were made to perform that task on the, on the occasions of the French expositions in 1806, in 1819, in 1827, in 1834, and in 1844. 
On the first occasion, the distribution adopted it was entirely geographical. On the second, it was that what was called an entirely material or natural system, dividing the arts into 39 heads, the consequence of which is said to have been great confusion. In 1927, a purely scientific arrangement was attempted into five great divisions, namely chemical, mechanical, physical, economical, and miscellaneous arts. But this was deemed too artificial and abstract, and in 1834, M. Dupin made the division depend on the relation of the arts to man, meaning as being alimentary, sanitary, vestiary, domiciliary, locomotive, sensitive, intellectual, preparative, social. This analysis was also adhered to in 1839. In 1844, an attempt was made to unite some of the features of the previous systems, and the objects were classified as woven material, mechanical, mathematical, chemical, fine arts, ceramic, and miscellaneous, which was still complained of as confused, but which was, on the whole, retained in 1849. I do not think there is any presumption in claiming for the classification which has been adopted in the Great Exhibition of 1851 a more satisfactory character than we can allow to any of those just mentioned, if we ground our opinion either upon the way in which this last classification was constructed or the manner in which it was, has been found to work. And there is one leading feature in it which, simple as it may seem, at one gives a new recommendation. In the systems already mentioned, there were no gradations of classification. There were a certain number, 39 or 5, 9 or 8, of coordinating classes, and that was all. In the arrangement of the Great Exhibition of 1851, by a just and happy thought, a division was adopted of the objects to be exhibited in four great sections, to which other wares, afterwards established, were to be subordinate. These sections being raw materials, machinery, manufactured goods, and the works of the fine arts. The effect of this grand division was highly beneficial, for within each of these sections, classes could be formed far more homogeneous than was possible while these sections were all thrown into one mass. When, for instance, the cotton tree, the loom, and the muslin stood side by side as belonging to vestiary art, or when woven and dyed goods were far removed as being examples the former of mechanical, the latter of chemical processes. Suitable gradation is the felicity of the classing art, and so it was found to be in this instance. But within this limit, how shall classes be formed? Here also it appears to me, simply as a reader of the history of the exhibition, which anyone else may read, that the procedure of those who framed the classification was marked with sound good sense and a wise rede rejection of more technical rules. For by assuming fixed and uniform principles of classification, we can never obtain any but an artificial system, which will be found in practice to separate things naturally related and to bring objects together quite unconnected with each other. It was determined that within each of the four sections, the divisions of which had been determined by commercial experience to be the most convenient, those should be adapted. Quote, eminent men of science and of manufacturers in all branches were invited to assist in drawing each one of the boundaries of his own special class of productions. End quote. And it was resolved, for the general purposes of the exhibition, to adapt 30 broad divisions, of which classes, four were raw materials, six machinery, 19 of manufacturers, and one of the fine arts. And these 30 classes may be considered as having been confirmed by their practical application to the collection and to the work of the juries dealing with it, except that in some instances it was found, ne found necessary to subdivide a class into others. Thus, class 10, which was originally prescribed as philosophical instruments, was found to consist of materials so heterogeneous that there were separated from it three subclasses of musical, of orological and of surgical instruments. And to class 5, machines, was added an accessory class, 5A, carriages. And on the other hand, classes 12 and 15, woolen and worsted, 
it was found could be advantageously thrown into one class. Within these classes, again, were other subdivisions, which were marked in the catalog by letters of the alphabet. Thus, the third class consists of substances voted for food, and of these, the vegetable division contains six classes, A, B, C, D, E, F. The first being cereals and the like, the second fruits, the third drinks, and so on. In like manner, the sixth class, manufacturing machines and tools, had subclasses A, B, C, D, F, as A, all spun and woven fabrics, B, manufacturers of metals, C, manufacturers of minerals and mining machinery, and the like. And again, each of these subclasses were separated into heads by numbers. Thus, the subclass cereals and the like are 1, common cereals, 2, the less common, 3, millet, 4, pulse and cattle food, 5, grasses and roots, 6, flowers of ground grain, 7, seeds, 8, hops. And the subclass A of manufacturing machines and tools included the heads 1, machinery for spinning and working cotton, wool, flax, hemp, silk, for working kachuk, gutta percha, hair. 2. Paper making. 3. Printing. And to show how much practical experience sub govern these subdivisions, I may mention that the great aid in this task was found in the trades directories of Birmingham and Manchester and other great manufacturing towns. I have followed this classification into the ultimate ramification of the catalog, at risk of being, I fear, tedious for a moment. Partially because I wish to make a reflection upon it, and partially also that you may see what a vast work is performed in this classification if it is to be really coherent and sound. For first, turn your attention to one head which I have mentioned. This single head includes no less than this, all the machinery for the complete formation from the raw material of all fabrics of cotton, wool, flax, flax hemp, silk, kachuk, gutta percha, and hair. This is head one of subclass A. Under this head, or under this first particular head, cotton, are very many articles of the Great Exhibition. Beside this particular heads, and the other particular heads, wool, flax, kachuk, etc., included in the general head one. There are two other heads in this subclass, each of like extent. Along with the subclass A are subclasses B, C, D, E, F, each of which an extent not much inferior to A, and thus this class 6 contains a great mass of heads, each including a vast number of articles. Yet in the catalog, this class 6 is one of the smallest extent of all of the 30. And though this may arise in part from some of the others being followed out into greater comparative detail than this class 6, yet still enough will remain in this mode of putting the matter to show you how vast and varied is the mass of objects which has thus been classified, and how great the achievement is if this mass have really been reduced into a permanent order. If this chaos, not of elements only, but of raw materials mixed with complicated machines, with manufactured goods and sculpted forms, have really been put in a shape in which it will per per permanently retain traces of the order in hand. What the value and advantage would be of a permanent and generally accepted classification of all materials, instruments, and productions of human art and industry, you will not you will, none of you, require that I explain at length. One consequence would be that the manufacturer, the man of science, the artisan, the merchant, would have a settled common language in which they could speak of the objects about which they are concerned. It is needless to point out how much this would facilitate and promote their work together, and how fatal to cooperation is diversity and ambiguity in the language used. One of our old verse writers, expanding, according to the suge suggestions of his fancy, the account of the failure of men in the case of the Tower of Battle, Babel, has made this cause of failure very prominent. He supposes that, the language of the workmen being confounded, one of them asked for a spade, his companion brought him a bucket, or when he called for mortar, handed him a plumb line, and that by the constant reoccurrence of these incongruous proceedings, the work necessarily came to a stand. 
Now, the conditions necessary in order that workmen may work together really go much further than the use of common language in the general sense of the phrase. It is not only necessary that they should call a brick a brick, a wire a wire, and a nail a nail, and a tube a tube, and a wheel a wheel, but it is desirable also that wires and nails and tubes and wheels should each be classified in name so that all bricks should be of one size, so that wire number three or a tube section one or a six inch wheel should have a fixed and definite signification, and that wires and tubes and wheels should be constructed so as to con correspond to such significations, and even except for special purposes, no others than such. It may easily be conceived, for instance, how immensely the construction, adjustment, and repair of wheel work could be facilitated if wheels were of a certain or if wheels of a certain kind were all made with teeth of the same kind, so that any one would work with any other. And something of this sort, something which secures some of these and the like advantages, has been done with reference to cast iron tooth wheels. An eminent engineer whose works stood in the sixth class of the collection to which I have just referred has proposed a system by which a like uniformity should be secured in the dimensions and fitting of machinery, and especially with regard to screws, fixing thus their exact diameter and pitch, as it is called, a process which would have the like effect of making the construction, application, and repair of all work into which screws enter vastly more easy and expeditious than it now is. Now these are the great and beneficial effects which follow from a good and generally accepted subclassification of one of the lowest members of that classification which the catalog exhibits to us. Mr. Whitworth would classify screws and wheels and axles as the millwrights have classified toothed wheels. But screws or wheels or axles are merely one kind of tool one element of machinery, and tools and machinery are only one class out of thirty of the great collection of which we are speaking. If then so great benefits arise from a common understanding as to the species of one of the lowest members of our classification, may we, th may we not expect corresponding advan advantages from a fixation of the names and distinctions of the higher members? of the names of tools and machines, for instance, and from the perception of their relations to each other, which a good classification brings into view, and then again from a clear perception of the relation of class to class, and of their lines of demarcation. And may we not expect that on such grounds the very language of art and industry, and the mode of regarding the relations of their projects, shall bear forever the impress of the Great Exhibition of 1851. There is one other remark which I should wish to make suggested by the classification of objects of the exhibition, or rather a remark which is possible to express only because we have such a classification before us. It is an important character of a right classification that it makes general propositions possible a maxim which we may safely regard as well-grounded, since it has been delivered independently by two persons, no less different from one another than Cuvier and Jeremy Bentham. Now, in accordance with this maxim, I would remark that there are great or there are general reflections appropriate to several of the divisions into which the exhibition by its classification distributed. For example, let us compare the first class, mining and mineral products, with the second class, chemical processes and products. In looking at these two classes, we may see some remarkable contrast between them. The first class of arts, w those which are employed in obtaining and working metals, are among the most ancient. The second, the arts of manufacturing chemical products on a large scale, are among the most modern which exist. In the former class, as I have said, art existed before science. Men could shape and melt and purify and combine metals for their physical purposes before they knew anything of the chemistry of the metals, before they knew that to purify them was to expel oxygen or sulfur, that combination may be definite or indefinite. Tubal Cain, in the first ages of the world, was the instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. But it was very long 
before there came an instructor to teach what was the philosophical import of the artificer's practices. In this case, as I have already said, art preceded science. Even if now science has overtaken art. Even if now science can tell us why the Swedish steel is unmatched, or to what particular composition the Toledo blade owes its fine temper, which allows it to coil itself up in its sheath when it is rigid thrust when its rigid thrust is not needed. Here art has preceded science, and science has barely overtaken art. But in the second class, science has not only overtaken art, but is the whole foundation, the entire creator of the art. Here art is the daughter of science. The great chemical manufactories which have sprung up at Liverpool, at Newcastle, at Glasgow, owe their existence entirely to a profound and scientific knowledge of chemistry. These arts never could have existed if there had not been a science of chemistry, and that an exact and philosophical science. These manufactories now are on a scale that at least equal the largest establishments which exist among the successors of Tubal Cain. They occupy spaces not smaller than that, the great building in which the productions of all the arts of the world were gathered and where we so often wandered until our feet grew weary. They employ, some of them, five or six large steam engines. They shoot up the obelisks which convey away their smoke and flames to the height of the highest steeples in the world. They occupy a population equal to that of a town, whose streets gather around the walls of the mighty workshop. Yet these processes are all derived from the chemical theories of the last and the present century, from the investigations carried out in the laboratories of Schella and Kerwin, Bertolet and Lavoisier. So rapidly is the case, or is in this case, have, has the tree of art blossomed from the root of science? Upon so gigantic a scale have the truths of science been embodied in the domain of art. Again, there is another remark which we may make in comparing the first class, minerals, with the third class, or rather the fourth, vegetable and animal substances, used in manufactures or as implements or ornaments. And I wish to speak especially of vegetable substances. In the class of minerals, all the great members of the class are still what they were in ancient times. No doubt a, new, a number of new metals and mineral substances have been discovered, and these have their use and of these the exhibition presented fine examples. But still, their use is upon a small scale. Gold and iron at the present day, as in ancient times, are the rulers of the world. And the great events in the world of mineral art are not the discovery of new substances, but of new and rich localities of old ones. The opening of the treasures of the earth in Mexico and Peru in the 16th century, in California and Australia in our own day. But in the vegetable world, the case is different. There, we have not only a constant accumulation and reproduction, but also a constantly growing variety of objects fitted to the needs and uses of man. Tea, coffee, tobacco, sugar, cotton have made man's life and the arts which, which sustain it very different from what they were in ancient times. And no one, I think, can have looked at the vegetable treasures of the Crystal Palace without seeing that various wealth of the vegetable world is far from yet exhausted. The Liverpool local community have enabled us to take a starting point for such a survey by sending to the exhibition a noble collection of specimens of every kind of import of that great emporium, along which, as might be expected, the varieties of vegetable produce are the most numerous. But that objects should be reckoned among imports implies that they are already extensively used. If we look at the multiplied collections of objects of the same kind, some from various countries, not as wares to a known market, but as specimens and suggestions of unexplored wealth, we, have no, we can have no doubt that the list of imports will hereafter, with great advantage, be enlarged. Who knows what beautiful materials for the makers of furniture are to be found in the collection of woods from the various forests of the Indian archipelago, or of Australia, or of Tasmania, or of New Zealand. 
Who knows what we may hereafter discover to have been collected of fruits and oils, of medicines and dyes, of threads and cordage, as we had here from New Zealand and from China examples of such novelties, of gums and vegetable substances, which may, in some unforeseen manner, promote and facilitate the processes of art. How recent is the application of Kokchuk to the general purposes? Yet we know now, and on this occasion, America would have taught us, if we had not known, that there is scarcely any use to which it may not be applied with advantage. If a teacher in our time were to construct maxims like those of the son of Sirach in the ancient Jewish times, like him who says, quote, The principal things for the whole use of man's life are water, fire, iron and salt, flour of wheat, honey, milk, and the blood of the grape, oil and clothing, end quote. He could hardly fail to make additions to the list, and these would be from the vegetable world. Again, how recent is the discovery of the uses of gutta percha? In the great collection were some of the original specimens sent by Dr. Montgomery to the India House, whence specimens were distributed to various experimentalists. Yet how various and particular are, its, are now its uses, such as no other substance could replace. And it is not to be expected that our contemporaries, joining the insight of science to the instinct of art, shall discover among the various sources of vegetable wealth which the great exhibition has disclosed to them, substances as peculiar and precious in the manner of their utility as those aids thus recently obtained for the uses of life. And before we quit this subject, let us reflect, as it is impossible, I think, not to reflect, when viewing thus the constantly enlarging sphere of the utility which man draws from the vegetable world, what a view this also gives us of the bounty of providence to man, thus bringing out of the earth, in every varying clime, endless forms of vegetable life, of which so many and so many more than we can yet tell, are adapted to sustain, to cheer, to benefit, to delight man, in ways ever kinder, ever large, ever new, and of which the novelty itself is a new source of delighted contemplation. I might go on to make other reflections upon the particular characters of the various classes of the Great Exposition, but the time does not allow me, nor is it needful, since all I, that I aspired to do was to offer you specimens of such reflections. Several of the classes will, no doubt, suggest appropriate reflections to those who have to deliver lectures to you on special subjects. In the meantime, Though I must now hasten to a conclusion, I cannot but perceive how imperfectly I have discharged even the limited task which I ventured to undertake. For I have yet, or I have as yet, said nothing of the effect which must be produced upon art and science by this gathering of so many artists and scientists, if I may use the word, of the world together, by their joint study of the productions of art from every land, by their endeavors to appreciate and estimate the merits of productions and instruments of productions, of works of thought, skill, and beauty. In speculating concerning universities, we are accustomed to think that, without underrating the effect of lectures and tasks, of professors and teachers, still that among the most precious results of such institution is the effect produced upon those who resort thither by their intercourse with and influence upon each other. We know that by such intercourse there is generated a community of view, a mutual respect, and a general sympathy with regard to the elements of a liberal education and the business of national, social, and individual life which clings to men ever after, and tends to raise all to the level of the best. And some such effect as this would, we may suppose, be produced upon the students of the useful and the beautiful art by their resort to any university in common. To any university, I have said, but to what university have they been resorting during the past term? to a university of which the colleges are all the great workshops and workyards, the schools and societies of arts, manufacturers and commerce, of mining and building, of inventing and executing in every land, 
Colleges in which great chemists, great machinists, great naturalists, great inventors are already working in a professional manner to aid and develop all that capital, skill, and enterprise can do. Coming from such colleges to the Central University, may we not well look upon it as a great epoch in the life of the material arts, that they have thus begun their university career that they have had the advantage of such academical arrangements as there have been found, and still more, as I have said, that they have had the greater advantage of intercourse with each other. May we not expect that, from this time, the eminent producers and manufacturers, artisans and artists, of every department of art, and in every land, will entertain for each other an increased share of regard and goodwill, of sympathy in the great objects which man's office as producer and manufacturer, artisan and artist, places before him, of respect for each other's characters and for the common opinion of their body, all increased by their being able to say, quote, We were students together at the great university of 1851. End quote. <laughs> As we conclude this episode, let us here at the Scientific Odyssey wish you and your families a wonderful holiday season. I would like to take a personal moment to dedicate this to show to my father who passed away on December 14th after an 81 year lifetime filled with amazing stories and incredible adventures. My dad was born and raised in the basin and range country of northeastern Nevada, and his experience as a cowboy, a ranch hand, and an outdoorsman shaped his perspective and paradigm of life, part of which he passed on to me. If you'll grant me a bit of license, I'd like to take a moment to read a bit of my eulogy for him that speaks to how a single question asked on a family trip shaped my life and led indirectly to this podcast. As I did when my mom passed away, I would like to offer a few good words about my dad and what he taught me about life that I've carried with me as I've gone through this world. He's always been dad to me, not Hank, as I know he was to many of you, or father as he called his father, but dad. Having lived in the South for over two decades, I've come to learn that such titles are often important signals to the type of relationship between two people. To me, he was always dad, always right there beside me, coaching, mentoring, disciplining when necessary, but in each case, working with me to help me navigate and experience the world. As I've spent a good bit of time going through old pictures this last week, when I've found those in which we are both together, I've been struck by how often we are doing something side by side, and how often there's some kind of tool in his hand. There are construction sets and stereos, measuring tapes and circular saws, camping equipment and co cooking utensils, and even, one time, a telescope. While there was never a question of who was leading the adventure, I never felt as if he was domineering. He was by my side, helping me with something new. And that wasn't just with things. It was with the lessons he taught me about life, and I'd like to share one of those with you today. This first lesson goes back to a family trip we took when I was a young boy. We had gone to the Crater Lake National Park and I remember among the various adventures climbing up to the rim of the crater, the edge of an extinct exploded volcano, and looking over the lake with its perfectly blue water and expressing how amazing it was to my dad. He echoed back my excitement and then he asked me a question. I wonder what it would have been like to have been the first person to have ever seen this. That one question instantly and permanently reframed my perspective. It broadened my experience to think about some explorer, a pioneer maybe, or a Native American hunter who had no idea that something like this was even there and in the course of their exploration had come across it the first time. I immediately saw not only the crater, the lake, and the island within it with whole new eyes, but I saw the entire surrounding countryside differently. I looked towards the horizon and saw the hills and mountains and considered what it might be like to explore that 
without someone having gone there first. It was a theme he and I would share in many of our scouting exploits. While I have never been a hunter, my father passed on to me his deep love of the outdoors, and it was through scouting that we could share that together. In every new vista, I would remember his question and try to imagine what it would have been like to see what I was seeing with new eyes. Over time, I internalized that perspective, and the question has driven my choices throughout my career, first as a scientist, now as an educator. While the material I teach is old and familiar to me, each semester I try to remember that for my students, it is new and undiscovered country. However, in one case, in asking me to look towards the horizon, I think my dad was a little surprised that I took him more literally than he might have attended. That telescope he bought me from Sears one birthday, the one that we set up on the roof of our Easy Street home and pointed towards the eastern horizon as the moon rose full and bright, sparked something else as well. It helped me to begin to really look beyond the horizon, past the places, times, and ideas that I knew into a vast cosmos. That telescope planted a seed in fertile soil, and it would take me far beyond anything I think either of us ever imagined to ask that same question. One day, about two decades after that one night, I would discover something no one else had ever seen. I'm not sure Dad ever really understood much about what I did in my research, but I know that he was proud of me that I did it, proud that his son had pioneered where no one had gone. There was a moment, however, when the whole thing was brought full circle. In my first professional job in north central Kansas, I had the opportunity to work with my college's foundation director to build a new teaching observatory, the largest between Denver and Topeka out on the Great Prairie. As the project neared completion and we were putting the finishing touches on the building, Mom and Dad came out to Concordia to visit. One night I took them up to the new facility and we opened the dome and pointed the telescope up at the full moon. I told my dad how often I had thought of that night with the two of us on the roof so many years ago as we had worked to build what he was now standing in, and how I hoped I would be able to show a lot of kids what he had shown me. I could tell that he was both surprised and deeply touched. It was a good evening. Over the course of the next year, the Earl Bain Public Observatory held dozens of public viewing events throughout the college's service area. Between star parties where we invited people to come to the observatory to look through our telescopes, and programs where we took telescopes to the small communities around us, we had over 10,000 people, more than 10% of the entire population of the region, look beyond their horizons and expand their perspective. All because my dad bought me a telescope for my birthday, and then helped me learn how to use it to look farther. In a way, every one of those Kansans look through that little white scope on our roof on Easy Street as well. The eulogy goes on from there, but in my mind it is that question which has in many ways driven much of my exploration that goes into producing this podcast. Trying to see this world through new eyes, whether those be through personal experience, biography, histor history, or philosophy, allows us to go places that I don't think anyone else does. If I'm the navigator of this great voyage, maybe it's my dad, Henry Orange, named for the Dutch royal family, who's the captain of the Odyssey. If you are such an inclination, I hope you'll raise a glass to his memory. May it be eternal. And the next time you come across a vista that's new to you, you'll ask yourself, I wonder what it would have been like to have been the first person to have ever seen this. Next time, we'll take a look at the great philosophical debate of the Victorian period that changed the course of science, politics, and ethics for generations. Until then, full sails on your journey. <laughs>